Welcome to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast, featuring speakers from our 2017 event. This podcast features Dr. Don Flatten from the University of Manitoba, and his talk is called, Are All Phosphates Created Equal? Well, good morning, everyone. And um, there's a, there's a, a sub-theme to the Ag Days this year, and that is nostalgia. Going back to the f- 40 years ago, when the Weed Fair, which is the origin of Ag Day, started. So I have a little bit of a test, um, because 40 years ago, I was a university student at the University of Saskatchewan, and I had just come off of a summer working with uh, a herbicide called Treflan. How many of you have used Treflan or remember these yellow pails? Yeah, there's a few of you. This is back when my hair was blonde, uh, not platinum. And... um, we had contests back then. This is, this is I, I, I started, when I started thinking about 40 years ago, I kind of got lost in my memory. Remember, rape, anybody remember Rape Yield 30? We didn't even have canola back then. It was rapeseed. And if we could find a 30 bushel the acre crop, we planted a flag on it. Because the provincial averages were like in the low 20s, right? In terms of yield of rapeseed. That was a different time. Um, we had... Challenges with the social acceptability of agriculture. So there's a, a, a button from that time, Treflan, I'm proud to be a farmer. Boy, that hasn't changed. There's lots of challenges to, uh, to farming. But one of the things that really brought back some memories was um, this stage. Hidden in a machine shed east of Brandon is this stage that we use for Alanco's summer field tours and barbecues. Anybody remember... Uh, Rusker, the singing farmer, and Family Brown. Anybody remember that? And a field treated right is like gold in the pan. This is the stage for those summer tours, and it's at Adam and Barry Gurr's farm. And you can see there's a diagram here, or a picture of Treflan, the yellow Treflan being sprayed on ahead of a tandem disc, maximum tillage to incorporate the Treflan prior to a rapeseed crop. And then this is with recording, London recording artist Russ Gurr. So I started working with Adam Gurr's grandfather 40 years ago. And Adam is on the program later today. He'll be speaking, and we go through these generations. But it was kind of fun to sort of reminisce about 40 years ago. But that's not what I'm supposed to be talking about. I'm supposed to be talking about something completely different. So I'm supposed to talk about alternative sort of uh, phosphate fertilizers, and I'll give you the punchline right now in case you want to go to another session or go kick some tires. Although all types of fertilizer phosphorus are not created equal, they often end up that way because of reactions with soil. Because we're going to talk about reactions with soil, we're going to have to go back to the principles of phosphorus reactions, and I'll talk a little bit about that and how they influence the efficiency of phosphorus. And there's all sorts of different factors that interact with that phosphorus. It's a very reactive compound. And they react with different sources of commercial fertilizer in similar ways. So that over time, a lot of the different sources of phosphorus just become the same old stuff. S-O-S. And you can put that as politely as you want. Uh, But to maintain your phosphorus fertility, it doesn't matter how efficient your phosphorus source is in the short term, you've got to make sure that you can afford to apply it at rates equivalent to crop removal to maintain your pea fertility over the long term. Okay, so that's the punchline. But let's go back up and talk a little bit about theory. It's Thursday morning. Any of you here former diploma students? Hour and a half lectures on Thursday mornings in soil fertility, probably a memory you've been trying to forget. But we do have to sort of go back to some of these principles to explain why a lot of the phosphate fertilizers end up in the same form. There's lots of phosphorus in soil, 1 to 2,000 pounds of p 5 equivalent, the same measure that we use for fertilizer. Most of that phosphorus, though, is bound very strongly in soil, and it's tied up either in soil solids through precipitation reactions into the inorganic solids or immobilization, what John was talking about, when microbes feed on this nutrient and incorporate it into microbial and other type of organic matter. There's also adsorption reactions. Phosphorus gets stuck onto all sorts of different stuff all the time. 
And these reactions tie up a lot of the phosphorus that we add. And so in terms of fertilizer use efficiency, in the first year that we apply the fertilizer, it's often less than 20%, 10 to 20% on average. Is that what you'd estimate, Regas, something like that? 10 to 20% efficiency in the year of application. Because a lot of our phosphorus that we apply ends up down here attached to the soil particles or incorporated into the soil solids. So that we left with a very small amount of phosphorus in the soil solution, and there's only one form of phosphorus that the plant can use, and that's what we call orthophosphorus. Orthophosphorus has one phosphorus molecule, one phosphorus atom in each molecule. It's not in chains. If we take a look at the chains, like the polyphosphates, and you can get polyphosphate fertilizer, for example, the phosphorus is hooked together in chains. It's not immediately available to the crop. The con the concentration of phosphorus, though, in the solution is very, very low. What happens is there's movement to the roots by diffusion, very short distances, way less than a millimeter in length of the path that the phosphorus can move. And then that phosphorus that's in solution is renewed from what we call the labile reserves. There's phosphorus coming up from the solids, phosphorus coming up from the, solid, from the soil surfaces to replenish that very small amount of phosphorus that's in solution. So when you take a look at those different pools or reserves of phosphorus, there's some organic P, and it's highly variable in soil. Nine to 80 percent of the phosphorus in, in so Western Canadian soils can be found in this organic pool, and it's unpredictable in terms of its release. Sometimes it can come out quickly, sometimes it's coming out slowly. Very, very difficult to predict. So we don't rely on organic phosphorus mineralization very much. It's just too unpredictable. The precipitated forms of phosphorus down here, we have inorganic precipitates of phosphorus. The phosphorus in our soils has reacted with calcium to become relatively insoluble. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But that precipitated phosphorus, in fact, is the major form in which our fertilizer phosphorus can be found after it reacts with the soil. If you had very acid soils, like in South America or the southern U.S., it would be the iron and aluminum that's tying up our phosphorus, but in our soils, it's calcium and magnesium. And that calcium and magnesium is in huge amounts in our soils and overwhelms the soil's ability to sort of fight against it and keep its phosphorus soluble. The calcium and the magnesium are going to react very quickly. So to just go into that in a little bit more detail, and I know a lot of you aren't very interested in this chemistry, but this is sort of to explain why a lot of our phosphate fertilizers end up in the same form. We start off with a very soluble fertilizer, like 1152 monomonium phosphate. The concentration of phosphorus, if you measured it in a saturated solution, would be about 3.2 molars or moles per liter. That's just sort of a reference point. Very quickly, that phosphate fertilizer is going to react with calcium in the soil to form something called dical. Dical. Does anybody here have livestock? Any cattle? or pigs, or poultry, you use dical in your ration, right? And so, for example, if you have dical in your mineral ra ration out in the pasture as a supplement for cattle, the first rain that comes along, it doesn't dissolve and disappear. It's moderately soluble. Its phosphorus concentration with a saturated solution is only about one ten thousandth of a molar. That's a lot less soluble than the phosphate fertilizer, but it can renew that phosphorus in solution. Then more and more time goes on, more and more calcium reacts with phosphate, and it forms something called octocal. Octocal is the same material that's in our teeth and bones. Not very soluble, thank goodness, otherwise be, be, we'd be a bunch of mush in this room here together. But octocal isn't the most insoluble form of phosphorus. The phosphorus is still going to react until it forms one of these hydroxyapatites, fluorapatite or hydroxyapatite. This is phosphate rock. This is what phosphorus wants to be. From the time that you apply your phosphate fertilizer, and it doesn't matter what type of phosphate fertilizer you apply, it's going to try to crawl over into its original form, and it's got an extremely low solubility in less than a millionth of a molar. Very, very insoluble. If you wanted to put phosphate rock on your soil, as a, like an organic farmer might want to do, not picking on Ian in particular. Uh, it's about as useful as gravel as a fertilizer, okay? It just does not dissolve. So 
this is a relentless sort of chemical fact that these fertilizers that we apply, they might start off different, but they're all trying to make their way eventually to this phosphate rock from where they came from. Now there's adsorption reactions that occur too. This is where phosphorus gets stuck on the surface. But it doesn't take very long for those reactions to occur. And they're only important when you have very dilute solutions of phosphorus added. That's not the case where you're adding on a droplet of fertilizer or a granule of fertilizer. It's not a lot of adsorption. It's mainly precipitation. The adsorption is following a path that's fairly similar to the precipitation. It's getting tied up in acid soils with the aluminum and the iron and in our soils more of the calcium and magnesium. But it's not as big a deal for the uh, fertilizer reactions as the precipitation reactions are. So overall, when all is said and done, we look at pHs of 6 to 7 as being ideal because then we don't have a huge tie-up from the calcium and magnesium in our soil and we don't have a huge tie-up in acid soils from iron aluminum so that's sort of what we're talking about in terms of the split. Our soils tend to be on this calcium and magnesium side where those are the compounds that tie up our phosphorus, regardless of what form is applied. Now plants are trying to take up the phosphorus and they've got this very low concentration of orthophosphate to work with and then they're using a process called diffusion that moves like less than a tenth of a millimeter. Very, very short distances and that diffusion it's a complicated process, and its uptake is affected by a whole bunch of different environmental factors. Phosphorus is super, super reactive, and there's a lot of things that can mess it up or enhance it. And so you take a look at some long-term studies. Here's phosphorus responses on the same research plots in Saskatchewan over a 30-year period. Uh, these bars here are for the yield response on fallow. The blue bars are for the yield on stubble. You can see that phosphorus response varies a huge amount from year to year because of the reactivity of phosphorus being so sensitive to temperature, moisture, all those other sorts of things. So this slide doesn't show up very clearly with this particular projector, but there was a, a field in Saskatchewan, northeastern Saskatchewan, that Aaron Baldwin uh, followed as a sort of a crop scout. And I don't know if you can see it, but it had 70 pounds of N and 30 pounds of phosphate applied in the fall as a fall band. And then in the spring, they went over top with only 10 pounds an acre of phosphate applied as 1152. I don't know whether you can see that, but th that starter phosphorus made a big difference to the early season growth and vigor of that wheat crop compared to where they had no starter pea. Just 10 pounds of phosphate doesn't really make sense to me, but that picture sort of tells the story. Even just a small amount of starter pea can make a big difference on cold soils come springtime. Here's uh, some phosphorus responses that might be difficult for you to see. One of our former students, Corey Elliott, at Pipestone um, decided not to put on phosphorus for the tail end of a field when he was planting it, and he won't do that again because he had a huge increase in yield with his canola crop where he'd put on the phosphorus compared to where he hadn't. You can tell he's an Aggie because there's, the can there's cans of Budweiser in the corner of his machine shed. Um, <clears throat> I think there were some of these people in our motel last night, John. Uh, even at harvest time, once again, these, I apologize for the quality of the pictures. They don't show it, but, but uh, even at harvest time, a big yield response to that phosphate uh, applied. So we, we know that we need phosphorus. We've got to get it on early in the growing season to benefit the phosphorus. Corn, uh, John was talking about uh, crop sequencing a minute ago. And here's where a little bit of starter pea, 30 kilos per hectare, which is 27 pounds an acre, applied beside and below the, the, the seed row for corn. And this is on canola stubble, where this is, has no, no phosphorus applied as a starter. Uh, two, two and a half times as much early season growth of corn with that starter P. So we definitely need phosphate in our soils in Manitoba to grow decent crops. Um, what kind of phosphate fertilizer should we use? Well, most of our phosphate fertilizer comes from phosphate rock. And most of that phosphate rock is in fact located in northwestern Africa. And so these large reserves of phosphate rock are being mined out to produce all of our, pretty much all of our synthetic fertilizers. There are some alternative fertilizers on the market. 
Uh, Winnipeg has just announced that it's going to get back into recycling nutrients. This is hugely important for the future of humanity, to be honest. We can't just mine out these reserves forever. These reserves are located in politically unstable areas of the world. We've got to do a better job of recycling nutrients, so this is a good news story. There's a product called Crystal Green. Has anybody worked with Crystal Green? Crystal Green is a phosphate fertilizer being made from the wastewater treatment plant in Portage la Prairie. Uh, I think in Saskatoon and Edmonton as well, and it's a recycled form of phosphate fertilizer, same compound that's in kidney stones. So we're actually hoping that we can get this approved for organic production because this is a nice granular fertilizer that can fit right into a farming system, no problem, and it's recycled. There's also recycled phosphate from livestock manures, solid and liquid manures, and also we can make that same product as crystal green, struvite is the mineral name, from liquid pig manure or liquid dairy manure. So we've got some options in terms of different types of fertilizers, but most of our fertilizers are coming from phosphate rock. So let's just talk about some of the traditional phosphate fertilizers. Rock phosphate, we'll deal with that very briefly. Monomonium phosphate, triple super, which is an American uh, fertilizer, basically not used here in Western Canada, and then ammonium polyphosphate liquid. We'll just review those very quickly. Rock phosphate, as I mentioned, although it's got the phosphorus in it, is highly insoluble but it is sometimes recommended for organic farming. And if you have a soil that's acidic and it's at the Rodale Institute in the United States, they might be able to get some benefit from it. But any trials I've seen on soils that are typical for ours, it's virtually zero benefit. Because it's mainly this fluorapatite, the phosphate rock is extremely insoluble. The soil release of plant available, P, you know, might eventually, over centuries, be useful, but it's virtually, like I say, useless for a farm where you're exporting food products and nutrients in those food products. Your export rate will exceed the rate at which this is going to dissolve. But you can make it more effective by grinding into fine powder, combining it with elemental sulfur to try to get some acidity forming, ammonium changing to nitric acid, microbial inoculants, and in some parts of the world, they're getting some modest benefit from this form of phosphate, but I would not recommend it for Manitoba. Instead, we process the phosphate rock. There's huge unit trains bringing in phosphate rock from North Africa into Edmonton to the plant there where Agrium is making phosphate fertilizer, and it's converted into monomonium phosphate, putting ammonium in with the phosphoric acid, and it contains nitrogen as a nutrient, and that nitrogen is beneficial. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's a granular form that's very popular, has over 90% of the market share. Um, not as popular in the U.S. because they, they use some other products like diammonium phosphate, but very popular here. It's inexpensive to manufacture. It's probably the least expensive form of phosphorus we have, except for maybe manure. It's easy to handle. But it's going to react, even though it starts off very soluble. It's a water-soluble fertilizer. It's going to react with the, with the calcium in our soil to form this dical, which we talked about, similar to the livestock mineral supplement, the octocal, which is similar to our bones and teeth, and it's trying to get back to rock phosphate from where it came. That's where its home is. The ammonium content that's in it, 11% nitrogen, is beneficial, and it gives it a lower toxicity than for something called diammonium phosphate, a popular American fertilizer that has a high risk of uh, ammonia toxicity, just like putting urea in the seed row. It performs better than the calcium phosphates. The Americans and other people in the world use a calcium phosphate. It doesn't work particularly well. The ammonium is beneficial, the calcium is detrimental, and the net difference between those two types of fertilizers is significant. Do you have a question? The ammonium reaction or the phosphate reaction? The phosphate ions, as if they're floating around, the calcium goes after it, like a fox after a chicken. And it grabs it and takes it out of solution. And the trouble with the calcium phosphate fertilizer is you're buying foxes with your chickens. Does that help explain that? We can talk later, but it, this ammonium based product is quite a bit better than this triple super, which has this calcium in it. There's very little of it sold in Western Canada, thank goodness. 
It's called a bunch of different names, but it's not as effective as monoammonium phosphate. And this work was done many years ago. Here's 75 site years of study that John Mitchell wrote up in 1946. How many people here were around in 1946 and reading journals? Oh, not reading journals. This work's been done a long time ago. The University of Saskatchewan Soil Science were looking at these different phosphate fertilizers, and they found that the grain yield from this monocalcium phosphate, or triple super, even if it was applied at a higher rate of phosphate, was significantly poor yielding. And that work laid down the groundwork for us working with 1152 as our dominant fertilizer for the last 75 years. It's not as if monoammonium phosphate was just picked by chance. It was science. Okay? If we take a look at some more work published in 1949, they started working with radioactive phosphorus. After the Second World War, they had access to radioactive material for the first time in history, and they could label the phosphorus, and they looked at fertilizer phosphorus uptake from the monoammonium phosphate versus the calcium phosphate, and in every case, the fertilizer phosphorus uptake was better. But this is ancient history, but explains why 1152 is such a popular fertilizer today. There's ammonium polyphosphate, 1034, zero liquid. How many of you use 1034? Some polyphosphate in there. It's actually a mixture of orthophosphate plus these phosphate molecules joined into chains. That gives you a chance to have more phosphate per gallon of fertilizer if it's hooked up in chains like that. Makes it more efficient to haul and apply and all these other sorts of forms. But that polyphosphate is not immediately available. The day that you apply it, it's not going to be available to the plants. But the good news is, when it reacts it's with soil, it's going to change from the polyphosphate to orthophosphate and become the same thing, basically, as monoammonium phosphate. And so what happens is, you've got these polyphosphates in chains, and it's reacting with soil enzymes to form the orthophosphate. That happens within hours or just a few days of application, by the time your crop emerges and your seedling starts to use phosphorus, it's virtually the same as what monoammonium phosphate was. Where do we get that type of information? Here's the world's leading textbook in soil fertility, Havlin et al. And they quote this work here that shows that the polyphosphates get broken up into orthophosphates within hours of application. And this is Chang and Rax, 1977. This is work that was done with Manitoba soils 40 years ago exactly 40 years ago, okay? So the rest of the world knows that the polyphosphates work because of work done in Manitoba by um, the people in the Department of Soil Science. So all those fertilizers that we've talked, those two fertilizers we've talked about, ammonium polyphosphate, 11520, very similar in effectiveness. What about some of the non-traditional phosphorus fertilizers, mixtures, and additives? I want to talk a little bit about liquids. There was some liquid fertilizer work done in the Australian region that has very very high carbonates in soil, and they found that the liquid fertilizer worked better than the granular fertilizer because it moved further away from the granule application site. This work was done, though, and it only worked on the highly, highly calcareous soils. It did not work on the non-calcareous soils. It has not worked in Western Canadian trials. This work was done by Mike McLaughlin. He happens to have a brother-in-law in Winnipeg, and he comes through Manitoba all the time. He's a friend of ours. We've tried to duplicate his research, or colleagues of mine have tried to duplicate this research in Manitoba. We can't get the same results. Here's some work done on struvite, the sort of hog manure form of the crystal green product. This was work done in our department. And this concluded that the uh, struvite, even though it's not as soluble immediately, coming out of the, uh, out of the plant as uh, monoammonium phosphate, that it was uh, equivalent uh, to the regular 11520. We had three crops of uh, canola or wheat growing in, in, incubate, in uh, growth chamber studies, and we were comparing uh, the monoammonium phosphate, regular 1152, to struvite. We had another coated product in there, but we're not going to pay much attention to it today. Here's the uptake of phosphorus uh, and, and how it affected yield. Uh, for the canola crop in particular, in the first canola crop, uh, we had uh, struvite and monoammonium phosphate 
uh, behaving very similarly. So the 1152 and this uh, crystal green equivalent uh, were very similar in terms of effectiveness at increasing canola yield. The check yields were down here at less than half of the uh, fertilized yields. But in the second and the third crops, the slow release character of those um, artificial kidney stones, the struvite, uh, made for better, more efficient uh, yield response uh, in the second and third crops of canola. In wheat, the performance wasn't necessarily stellar, but overall, when we compared the canola recovery efficiency across all three sort of cycles, in total, the struvite was uh, similar to the, um, to the map, Oh, the map, that circle should be down here. The struvite in the map, similar in efficiency for the clay loam soil we worked with uh, from Dan Mazier's farm, if you want to get specific, or the sandy soil from near Rose Isle. Overall, the phosphorus uptake was not much different because the benefits in the canola were, were just um, um, more in terms of, 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 of diluting a little bit of that uh, phosphate out to, uh, to, 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 well, or saving the phosphate, I should say, for the second and the third crop. But when we took a look at the total phosphorus uptake, not much different. Struvite, more or less regarded in our study as equivalent to a regular 1152. Some more work done on liquids here that uh, Regis Karamanis and his colleagues uh, initiated in collaboration with Agvise and a colleague of mine at the University of Manitoba. They concluded that although there were differences in water soluble and bicarbonate or soil test extractable P from different uh, phosphate fertilizers in the initial period right after the fertilizer was applied, within two to four days, everything was in the same form. It was going through those reactions which affect all forms of phosphate, reacting with the calcium and the magnesium in soil. This was with three different soils from North Dakota, right, Regis? These are North Dakota soils. But they're kind of similar to ours. They're pH 6 to 8 and a range of uh, carbonate content. And there were uh, four treatments. There was phosphoric acid treatment, a urea phosphoric acid, and a polyphosphate, regular 1034, and then 1151, which is the same as our 1152. And you put in those four different fertilizers and just track them over time. Here's the amount of water extractable phosphorus. I know that these diagrams are small, but I want to show all three soils. After four days, these lines are very close together, indicating that the solubility of all of those fertilizer products became very similar. By that time, they were all changing over to dicalcium phosphate, like the dical mineral, and they behaved basically the same. Now, the soil test extractable phosphorus didn't do much different on these three soils. They became very, very similar uh, towards the uh, end of the experiment, which is only like 32 days after application. So that's, that'd be very early in the growing season. Still not much difference between the pea sources. So what starts off in the first two to four days is maybe being different by the time the seed germinates and emerges, you don't have much difference. What about cocktails? I'm not suggesting that it's time for cocktails. I'm saying, what about mixtures of fertilizers, other fertilizers with phosphorus? Uh, we, there's historical work done on, on combinations of ammonium uh, or urea, nitrogen, sulfate, elemental S, and thiosulfate, and I'll just walk you through this. This is the first time in 30 years I've talked about my PhD thesis. This is just an example of some P32 work, radioactive phosphorus. That's probably why our kids turned out the way they did. Uh, anyways, I, we're not supposed to talk about that. Here is urea and monoammonium phosphate, 4600 and 1152, separated at distances an inch below and beside the seed row, three inches beside the seed row and one inch below. Uh, that should be three inches beside the seed row and three inches below, three inches beside the seed row and, and five inches away, various distances away. The more distance between the seed row and the banded phosphate, the less phosphorus fertilizer uptake. When we added urea in with the nitrogen, as nitrogen in with the phosphate fertilizer, we stabilized the uptake so that we had similar uptake regardless of how far away that band was. This work that was done 30 years ago, I had no idea that a bunch of air, air seeders and air drills would be out there with 10 inch row spacings, but this basically says if you've got 10 inch row spacings and you're placing your fertilizer five inches away from each seed row, 
you can get better phosphorus uptake by putting some nitrogen fertilizer in with that phosphate band if it's five inches away. Now that's phosphate fertilizer uptake. When we looked at yield, no difference. Like we can go with these very sophisticated measurements of radioactively labeled phosphate, but it didn't really make any difference to yield. The plant looked after its phosphate needs just fine, thank you. So that's a very important factor to consider what we measure in terms of phosphorus uptake in early stages of reactions or even throughout a growth, the growth period of a crop doesn't always translate into yield. Here's some stuff with similar sorts of ideas. Urea, 4600 with 1152. My idea wasn't new. Bob Soper, who we mentioned just a few minutes ago, was doing this work in his master's program with Don Rennie 60 years ago. And they found that the urea and the monomonium phosphate, the ammonium sulfate and the monomonium phosphate was beneficial in terms of fertilizer phosphorus uptake. Nitrogen and ammonium sulfate are helpful in terms of stimulating phosphorus uptake. Here's what was going on in later. Oh, uh, Doug Beaver, anybody know Doug? Originally from Rivers. Now he's a, he's a big wig in Agrium. Anyways, and he did studies looking at 1152 combined with ammonium sulfate, 210024, and he found that he had better uptake of monomonium phosphate when the ammonium sulfate was applied with the phosphate. So here you have ammonium sulfate and monomonium phosphate combined, and the fertilizer phosphorus efficiency with canola, wheat, and flax is always better. So having some ammonium sulfate is beneficial for phosphorus uptake. Uh, there's some more work that was done by Derwin Hammond. Derwin has worked with the Canola Council for a long time uh, in Manitoba here. Fertilizer P efficient with ammonium sulfate being better than fertilizer uh, monomonium phosphate and ammonium sulfate applied separately in terms of fertilizer P efficiency. And in terms of dry matter yield uh, benefits as well, uh, different band widths, but still the combination of ammonium sulfate, 210024, and 1152 works out better than when those fertilizers are separated. Elemental S gets some attention. There's a, a concept that people have been working with for the last seven, 65 years. We've been trying to figure out if we add some elemental sulfur with the phosphorus, can we get the elemental sulfur to oxidize and convert to sulfuric acid? and help dissolve that phosphate and make it more soluble. They did some greenhouse studies, Mitchell et al., this is at U of S in 1952, and they found some benefits in terms of putting some elemental sulfur with the seed compared to no elemental sulfur. But when they went out in the field, it didn't work because the oxidation rates for elemental sulfur were too slow. If you grow your crops in a greenhouse, this concept will work. If you're growing your crops in a field, the cold soils and the inconsistent moisture conditions don't give us any benefit, and I don't think we've been able to duplicate these greenhouse results even like 70 years later. Uh, here's liquid ammonium thiosulfate, which is sort of an intermediate between a regular ammonium sulfate and, uh, and an elemental S. And this is work done by Greg Morden 30 years ago, and he found some benefits of putting ammonium thiosulfate in with the monammonium phosphate, or you could put maybe the... Uh, this ATS is like a, this is a pure form of 120026, but you could put 150020 liquid in with your 1034, maybe get some benefits. Um, here's the effect on yield, though, very little difference in yield. Benefits in terms of uptake, measured with radioactive phosphorus, labeled fertilizer, but not much difference in terms of actual yield. What about some other cocktails? This is, there's some cocktails being marketed out there that are supposed to prevent or reduce phosphorus retention in soils. We talked about precipitation, immobilization, absorption, all tying up that phosphorus. I've got more cocktails here because there's a lot of diversity with these sorts of additives. Very few of them have been tested under rigorous, uh, what I would call peer-reviewed scientific sort of uh, scrutiny, but this one has. Uh, this is it's a, a review article on the sequestration of phosphorus binding cations to prevent or reduce phosphorus tie up. And it was written by the Australian team that has the, Mike McLaughlin on out there right again. He's the guy that found the benefits for liquid phosphate in the really strongly calcareous soils in Australia. But when he tried to work with these 
uh, polymers to prevent phosphorus uh, tie-up in the soil. They didn't work. Some more uh, review by another American that used to work with the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority in, uh, on, on phosphorus uptake. This is published like three years ago and no benefits to this particular polymer. Uh, Regus has done some work on this as well. They tr you tried some, had some field trials in Alberta, right? And uh, the conclusion there based on their data, with or without this particular product called Avail, there was no difference in the grain yield response to phosphate. There's just too much calcium and magnesium in soil for a little bit of this polymer to make much of a difference. And in order to have any effect, you'd have to put this on in humongous amounts at enormous expense. So, what it does, what, it, what all this stuff boils down to is, you know, keeping in mind that the phosphorus behavior in soil is similar for a lot of different phosphate compounds. They end up tied up down here and down here, precipitated, immobilized, and absorbed. And especially by the calcium-rich material in our soils. No matter what you start with, you're going to end up probably forming these calcium phosphates. So the efficiencies of these conventional fertilizers that we use, MAP and APP, 1152, 1034, often similar, not a big advantage one way or the other, and they're, but they're certainly better than the American fertilizer, triple superphosphate. The liquid formulations, if you have a super calcareous soil like they do in some parts of Australia, can work well, but we haven't seen benefits from the liquid formulations here in Western Canada. The recycled material coming out of wastewater treatment plants, struvite, is equivalent to MAP, but don't expect mir miraculous benefits. Combinations of phosphorus and other fertilizers might benefit pea uptake, but we need to avoid bander seed row toxicity. If you put a whole bunch of urea fertilizer in with your phosphate fertilizer, that's going to prevent the roots from getting at that phosphate. So I would never advocate putting all of your phosphate fertilizer with nitrogen. Compounds that claim to reduce phosphorus retention have not been proven to work in situations like ours. There's a small area with a few trials many years ago where it seemed to have some promise, but we haven't seen it duplicated elsewhere in the world. But here's the most important point. Whatever fertilizer you choose, make sure that you can afford to balance the rates of pea application with pea removal. If you pay a lot per pound, and you're planning on putting on fewer pounds of phosphate, keep in mind your, your crop is going to remove large amounts of phosphate no matter what source you're using. Keep in mind that phosphorus balance is really important. We don't want to be applying way more phosphorus than the crops are removing or way less. Neither one of those is sustainable. But let's be real about the amount of phosphate taken out by crops. For canola, it's taking about one pound of phosphate per bushel. 50 bushel canola crop going to remove about 50 pounds of phosphate per acre. If you're putting on only 10 or 20, your phosphorus fertility is going to go down. It's not sustainable. Our typical sort of phosphorus management system in North America, or in fact most of the world, is that we've got these crops taking up large amounts of phosphate. A 60 bushel wheat crop requires 48 pounds of phosphate. 36 pounds of that is removed in the grain and goes to people like me in the city of Winnipeg that consume that. What do we do with that phosphate? We dump it in the Red River and the Brady Landfill. And then what does that mean for you guys? Since we don't give your phosphate back, you're dependent on synthetic fertilizer. We don't really have a cycle going on here, folks. We're very dependent on that synthetic fertilizer. If you don't add the phosphate back at the rates that it's removed, eventually your phosphorus fertility is going to go all to heck. So over 64% of our soils, two-thirds of our soils are phosphorus deficient. We don't have a luxury of a huge amount of phosphate in our soils to work with. And what happens, once again, I apologize for the quality of this picture. This is Canada's longest running organic crop rotation trial. Martin Ense's trial at Glenlee Research Station, where he hasn't added mineral nutrients at all. The alfalfa doesn't even grow anymore to supply nitrogen in his crop rotation. He had to add some compost from beef cattle in order to maintain his phosphorus fertility. Like after 10 to 15 years of organic production without phosphorus minerals, 
his productivity of his whole system crashed. Here's some results of a 30-year study in Saskatchewan at Indian Head where they had a green manure crop of sweet clover and it kept up with the fertilized trial for the first 15 years. It did fine. Then there was better and better yield from the fertilizer treatment and the yield from the green manure went down, down, down. It started running out of phosphorus. You need phosphorus fertility to optimize your growth. Here's a trial in Saskatchewan with wheat where they had different levels of broadcast P prior to putting on seed row P. Seed row P, no matter what rate they applied, they couldn't match the combination of seed row P plus broadcast P to improve the overall fertility in the soil. P fertility is important. So we're trying to encourage farmers to aim for like a 10 to 15 part per million range in terms of Olson P. And then if they've got less than that, try to build it up. If they've got more than that, they can draw it down with just putting on starter P. But if you're in the typical range, around 15 ppm Olson P, which is typical for Manitoba soils, you need to be applying P at the rates of removal. What sort of strategies are we recommending? You can put it in side row or mid row banding if your seed row limits are limiting you. You can use a rotational fertilization program, add extra P in the crops in rotation that tolerate high rates of seed row P so that in years where you're putting in soybeans or canola, you don't have to risk seedling injury. Periodically band P into the soil during fall tillage. We talked about the benefits of ammonium sulfate with 1152. Why not ban that in the fall prior to putting in a canola crop? And that's the crop where you restore your pea fertility and pay for all your previous sins of unbalanced pea removal versus uh, pea supply. And build your pea to a target level, looking for like around 15 part per million, not too much more, not too much less, and keep it in balance. Thanks for listening. We'll see you at Manitoba Ag Days 2018 from January 16th to 18th.